Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Welcome to everyone. This is Marin Chong from Interactive Brokers. Today, we are welcome uh, Tarek again because he will be our speaker today. We are pleasure to have a webinar in conjunction with uh, Singapore uh, Singapore Exchange today. And today's our topic is uh, making your yen count trading strategies on Japan's two SGX listed futures contracts. And last time, maybe everyone already took a webinar from Tarek, and we are briefly introduce him ourselves. Uh, Tarek Dennison is a CFP and runs investment portfolios from, for individual and institutional clients at GM, GFM Asset Management in Hong Kong. He has previously worked on different banks and worked for uh, uh, different major IBANs in New York, Toronto, London, and Hong Kong. And Tarek holds a Master in Financial Engineering at the University of California. And he also teaches uh, fixed income and alternative investments at a, at a asset business school in Singapore and to professional fund managers, private bankers, and CFA Singapore. So uh, this time, we are happy to have a webinar again. And if you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to raise your questions over the chat, and Tarek will answer your questions at the end of the webinar. Also, we will do the records on the webinar. You will receive the link through the email afterwards. Thank you, Tarek, for, Tarek, for joining us today. So uh, I'll, I'm passing the webinar to Tarek now. So please hold on. Welcome, Tarek. Are you ready? Screen. Quick yeah, show my you. screen. So mm -hmm. I'll hide this here. Great. Can everyone see my screen? Uh, good. Let me put this in expansion mode or hold this, hold this thing full screen mode. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Good. So, as mentioned, my name is Tarek Dennison. Thank you very much for the introduction, Myron, and thank you for hosting Interactive Brokers and SGX. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about SGX listed futures contracts on Japan, and that includes the Nikkei equity futures, the JGB government bond futures, and yen currency futures. Uh, first, I have two pages of disclaimers to show you. First of all, this is the GFM disclaimer. And here is a separate disclaimer by SGX. As Myron mentioned, my name is Tarek Dennison. I'm a certified financial planner by the uh, IFPHK here in Hong Kong and Macau. I manage investment accounts on the Interactive Brokers platform on a discretionary basis. So I'm one of the advisors you can choose from the um, Interactive Brokers marketplace. We have a US entity, GFM Asset Management LLC, for handling all of accounts outside of Hong Kong and Macau, including US taxable accounts and US IRAs. And we have GFM Group Limited, which is our Hong Kong Type 9 licensed entity for handling accounts with Hong Kong and Macau addresses. I have over 15 years of capital markets experience, starting at Commerce Bank in New York, London, and Frankfurt, then at Bear Stearns, J.P. Morgan, CIBC, and Societe Generale. I have a master's degree in financial engineering from the University of California at Berkeley. I teach fixed income and alternative assets at Essex Business School in Singapore. And as you can probably tell by how quickly I speak, I'm a prolific speaker, writer, and traveler, follower of Asian markets, U.S. politics, and tax policy. I very much specialize in investment flows from one side of the Pacific to the other. That is, Asians investing in the US and Americans investing out here in the Asia Pacific region. So, why are we here talking about Japan? Uh, Japan is probably a country that many, many of you very well know. Any of you who remember the 1980s, remember it was a very important country then, and seems to have fallen off the radar of many, many investors since then. Uh, but it's still a country that has 126 million people, which is still, still relatively large, about 40% of the population of the US. It has a GDP of about five trillion U.S. dollars, and that's comparable in both uh, purchasing power parity and official exchange rate. So, quite unlike China, which has, which is the largest purchasing power parity exchange um, GDP, but a much much lower official exchange rate GDP, indicating that the renminbi is undervalued. Purchasing power parity does not indicate that the Japanese yen is undervalued in quite the same way. Uh, gross national savings is 27% of GDP. So this is what makes Japan somewhat distinctive when compared to the U.S. or Western Europe. Very often we're told is think of Japan as a country with roughly half the U.S. population and roughly the same per capita GDP as the U.S., but with four times the savings rate. 
And what that means is that Japan is a country with roughly two times the amount of assets and cash sloshing around its investment pool than you would see in the U.S. And that gives a lot more appreciation to how large and how advanced the Japanese market is. So by comparison, the savings rate is 18% in the U.S. and 47% in China, which obviously will make you feel um, that uh, China is a much, much bigger market in that way. One thing that's uh, quite interesting to look at is the 235% debt to GDP ratio. It is the single most indebted country in the world by total amount of government debt. Now, it's often said by um, defenders of Japanese debt that most of it is held internally and is not quite a, it is not at as much risk as the U.S. However, U.S. treasuries are a go-to asset for many foreign investors, which are not the case uh, in Japan. Uh, the market cap of all the assets uh, of all of the listed stocks in Japan is also about five trillion U.S. dollars. That makes it number four after the uh, after the U.S., uh, Hong Kong, and China, I believe. Um, the M1, which is the total money supply, the number that we mentioned earlier, is about six trillion. I think there's a typo there that still wasn't corrected, making it the third largest money supply pool uh, after China, EU, and ahead of the U.S. Now you'll probably remember from Economics 101 lessons. M1 is, uh, is a measure of money supply. It's not the same as the amount of assets investable in the overall economy. So we were mentioning earlier how back in the 1980s, Japan was one of the most important economies in the world. And we're going to mention later on basically a brief history of two eras of the Nikkei and Japanese stock market from its rise to its peak in 1989 and the period since then. You'll notice right in the middle of this chart is the light blue uh, segment showing what share Japan has held as, as a percentage of the world economy uh, between 1980 and uh, 2022, so five to five years in the future. Uh, it's gone from being about 7% of the world's economy to increasingly going to be about 3 to 4% of the world's economy. And the clear winner in this picture, of course, is China, which has gone from being 2% of the world's economy to 20% of the world's economy. So this is why many people are, are paying far more attention now to Japan rather than China. But as an investor, I still find many, many interesting investment opportunities in Japan precisely because it's not growing as quickly. Uh, also in terms of market capitalization, you may re uh, remember if you look back on the green line back in the late 1980s, the market cap of Japan briefly surpassed that of the United States around the time of the Nikkei bubble in the late 1980s, but since then has remained relatively flat for about the past 30 years. While the U.S. market cap has continued to grow to over 30 trillion U.S. dollars, and China has developed a market pretty much out of nowhere from the late from the early 1990s to now be one of the largest in the world uh, since surpassing Japan. Now, although we've, meant, we've talked about the decline of Japan in two ways, first from being one of the world's largest economies to being the fourth largest economy, uh, and now um, uh, being a smaller stock market than even China's, uh, we do want to mention that in terms of MSCI weighting, that the weight that institutional investors give Japan, it is still the second largest single country in the MSCI all, all countries world index. One of the reasons for this, of course, is that the A shares, China A shares, are not yet included in the uh, MSCI All Country World Index. But MSCI has announced the decision to include uh, the MSCI A shares. Uh, but of course, Japan still has a relatively large, significant market cap, which is very accessible to foreign investors and doesn't have many of the issues that uh, Chinese equities have faced. On to the bond market. The bond market, as mentioned, is also one of the largest in the world. Japan, the Japanese government is one of the most uh, indebted governments in the world. Part of the Japanese bond market from the late 1990s until today in 2017. Uh, it's grown from uh, about $3 trillion U.S. dollars to over $10 trillion U.S. dollars. The landmark hit a few years ago was that total Japanese government debt surpassed the landmark level of one quadrillion Japanese yen, which is uh, around $10 trillion U.S. dollars. One important thing to notice about this chart is that most of the growth in that debt has been government debt, specifically Japanese government bonds, and that the small amount of corporate debt on the top really has not changed or really has not grown. So when talking about the crowding out of corporate debt and the fact that Japan doesn't really have much of a corporate bond market and basically no high yield bond market, that's, that's unfortunately one of the side effects of uh, massive government borrowing, despite very, very low interest rates. So in terms of demographics, I very much believe that Japan is a sign of the future, it's a kind of a picture into what many other countries are going to look like as they get older and they have 
uh, far older median populations uh, than, than even the United States or Western Europe do, but especially when compared to China. So uh, when you look at the two growth curves, on the left you have China and on the right you have Japan, and you'll notice a series of red dots and blue dots. The red dots are when the growth rate of the country is accelerating and the, and the uh, country is rapidly developing. So Japan in the 1950s to the early 1960s was a very high growth country as it was coming out of World War II and it was developing from a low income country, low income country very quickly to a middle income country and it passed the middle income tra trap to become a high income country. Uh, one important thing that I'm going to be pointing to later is that on a per capita GDP basis, Japan is still a wealthy Western country, whereas China, even despite its size, is only bigger because it has about 10 times as many people. The blue dots uh, over here show that as the population, um, as the population has been aging, the growth rate, the GDP growth rate, uh, has declined. As on the bottom scale shows the GDP per capita has approached U.S. levels. So the way of reading these charts is as it approaches the right edge over here, the country is becoming as rich on a per capita basis as the United States. Now over on the left, if you compare it to China, China is still all red dots because China is still growing rapidly. But if you look at the bottom, you're still talking about 10% of U.S. per capita GDP levels. China is still nowhere near uh, the levels of having the average Chinese be as wealthy as the average American or the average Japanese. So this is the chart of per capita GDP comparing Japan with the, with the US, uh, Germany, China, and India. Uh, so this shows very clearly that when we're talking about Japan, even though we're talking about declining growth rates, a lot of that really has had to do with the fact that the population has remained stable, the population hasn't grown. Where in many other countries, overall GDP growth has come just as much from population growth as from uh, productivity and other economic drivers. These are the population pyramids comparing China, Japan, the United States, and India. Um, and very often when we look at demographics, there are uh, two to three types of population pyramids you look at. So the bottom right-hand corner, you have India, and you have the typical population pyramid profile of a developing country or of an emerging market, a very young population with more kids in each younger cohort than in the, in the older cohort. cohort. And what that means is you have a young, still rapidly growing population, and you don't really have to worry about supporting retirees. You don't have problems like you would see in China, Japan, when you look at the top two, where uh, middle-aged and older people actually outnumber younger people. And you'll see to the right in Japan, Japan actually has one of the worst cases of this, where pretty soon retirees, or at least people over the age of 65, will outnumber people under the age of 65. And we'll have to see what does that mean in terms of drawing down savings, not requiring higher rates of return, not investing in growth, uh, or just simply having people work longer. By comparison, if you look on the lower left, the United States has a relatively healthy population pyramid, at least when compared with, with Japan and China, in the sense that it's not so top heavy. And those of you who follow U.S. news will, will hear that Americans themselves still complain about the uh, retirement crisis and problem with Social Security. But at least demographically, it's not, it's not as challenged as Japan is. So what is the, what is the demographics of Japan meant for Japanese bond markets? I mentioned that the government uh, has record levels of debt, but despite that, yields have been going down. This may in some ways almost make no economic sense. You would think that with the supply of bonds being very, very high, uh, that, that would uh, drive the prices down. But actually, low yields mean the prices of Japanese bonds are high. And these four curves show the yield curve of the Japanese government bond market at the very top, purple line is in 1987, and then the green line is in 1997. And from uh, 1997 to 2007, the whole decade could be described as just a brief flattening. There was a zero interest rate policy for a while in the early 2000s. And then in 2005, 2006, the BOJ started raising rates, and you had long-term interest rates in the 1% to 2% range, which are still low by global standards, but they're not what they are today. Uh, in the age of, uh, of Abenomics, the, uh, Japan now has a negative interest rate policy where short-term interest rates and actually yields all the way up to 10 years are negative, and only from the 10-year to the 40-year range do you have Japanese government bond yields in the 0 to 1% range. But as we'll see soon, even the absolutely low levels of yield does not mean that Japanese government bonds have low, re low absolute returns or, or something that should be ignored. Rather, uh, what we see here, this is the chart of what your excess return would be from investing in Japanese government bond futures, basically buying them and rolling them uh, every quarter over a, um, 
uh, over in this case since 1974. Now, of course, uh, earlier data I had to synthesize because we didn't have JGB futures trading back then. But from 1974 until about 1992, uh, the strategy of buying and rolling Japanese government bond futures would have done nothing. And this is even though uh, interest rates at the time were relatively high in the 5 to 7% range. Uh, at the time, the big bull market for uh, buying and rolling Japanese government bond futures has been from the early 1990s until now. So really until 2016, 2017. I very often pose as a question to traders. I say back in the year 2000, uh, short-term Japanese interest rates were zero, long-term Japanese interest rates were one and a half. Uh, Australian short-term interest rates were 6% and, and Australian long-term interest rates were 6%. Which bond market do you think did better over the next 10 years? And many don't get right that Japan actually had the, the far better performing bond market, both on an absolute return basis, but also on a risk adjusted basis. So you'll notice here that most of the growth from 1990 to 2016 has been with very, very low volatility and very, very low drawdowns, even in 2008. Uh, because basically what's happened is that when you buy the JGB future, you roll down the curve until the next future, and then you buy the next future, and you're basically earning that return only really facing risk if JTB yields go up, which so far they've not done. And when the reason I spent so much time talking about demographics earlier is saying what would be there to possibly drive Japanese interest rates up. There are so many old people and so many pensioners buying long-term Japanese government bonds or owning pension plans who have to buy long-term uh, yen bonds um, that there's, a, there's resistance for rates going up much higher than they are. Now, moving from bonds to stocks, uh, what about the Nikkei 225 index? So the Nikkei 225 index is still the most widely quoted index of Japanese equities. It is arguably the most uh, widely quoted price-weighted index in the entire world. And I'm going to be explaining a little bit later what that means. So it represents uh, Asia's biggest advanced economy. It was the first Asian equity index to be represented in the futures market. So obviously before there were Hang Seng futures, before there were Straits Times or MSCI Singapore futures, there were Nikkei futures. Uh, and originally they were traded in Osaka, and any of you who read the uh, book Ugly Americans know that even in the 1990s, uh, the fingers that pressed the keys for trading Osaka traded uh, Nikkei futures contracts had to physically be located in Osaka. And that was one of the reasons that uh, SGX, which was then called Cymex, uh, listed Nikkei 225 futures more than 30 years ago uh, in Singapore. So they were yen denominated, and they were the chance for investors who were trading electronically or trading on the phone and didn't have someone on the ground in Osaka to be able to trade the Nikkei with about as much liquidity as they'd be able to get in Osaka. The chart below here shows the correlation between the Nikkei 225 index and the dollar and the dollar yen exchange rate. So this is the well-known relationship that as the yen weakens, the Nikkei goes up, and as the yen strengthens, uh, the Nikkei goes down. Uh, this has led to a common problem with many portfolio managers where they convert money into yen, they buy Japanese equities, the Japanese equities goes up, but the yen weakens. And so that basically is completely offset their profit. And one of the strategies I'm going to show later on shows that by buying and rolling Nikkei futures, but not converting over your margin, basically gives you access to the Nikkei without much of the FX exposure. So a little bit more about the Nikkei 225 index. As mentioned, it's the last widely used major price weighted index after the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And unlike the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the Nikkei still is the main index uh, tracked, by, um, tracked by traders in the futures markets, used as a benchmark, and especially used as an underlying in retail investment products. The main alternatives to the Nikkei index would be the Topics uh, indices. So that includes the Topics Core 30, the Topics 100 of the 100 largest companies in Japan, the Topics 400 mid, which are the um, 400 mid-cap Japanese companies, and then the topic small cap. So the topics in many ways is more like the Russell, if you wanted to compare it to the Nikkei. And there's also an MSCI Japan index, uh, where the MSCI Japan index is mostly tracked by futures and by foreign institutional investors. Um, so to compare what is the difference between the Nikkei and the topics in the MSCI Japan, if you look down at the components here, the top three components in the Nikkei index are fast retailing, soft bank group, and Sanok simply because they have high per share prices of 48, 41,000, 23,000, and 19,000 yen per share uh, as it is a price-weighted index. By comparison, the top three components in both the topics and the NSCI Japan are Toyota, Mitsubishi UFJ Bank, and SoftBank, which is the telephone carrier. So there's only one component that overlaps in the top three uh, of both. 
the Nikkei 225 futures trade both in Osaka, Singapore, and now also in Chicago. And Chicago has futures that trade both in Japanese yen and in U.S. dollars. Um, the, these 225 stocks cover 60% of the market cap of the first section of the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Uh, so the Tokyo Stock Exchange is divided into a first section, a second section, and what's called the Mother's Index, the market of the high growth and emerging uh, stocks. Uh, sort of like you would have a main board and a gem board or an SGX and main board and catalyst. Uh, down below, it shows you the uh, sector weightings of the, of the uh, Nikkei components, 43% in technology, 22% in consumer goods, 16% in materials. And it also shows you by number of issues, again, 58 of the 225 stocks are in technology and 21 of them are financials. This is a familiar chart of the Nikkei 225 index from 1949 to 2017. And this chart is uh, easily available on FRED, which is the St. Louis Fed's information website. And this is how I often describe in the long term how uh, the Nikkei can be thought of as having two periods or two different eras. One is going from 1950 to 1989, 1990, where the Nikkei ran up from a base level of 100 all the way up to almost 40,000. And then the next has been the level since then where it is mostly traded sideways in this range. Now, the nice thing about this range over here, many would say, is this proof that buy and hold investing in Japan is, is a bad idea? If you bought and hold in 1989 and you've held until now, you would have lost a lot of money. Well, actually, if you include a lot of your dividends, you'd probably be about breaking even just by buying the Nikkei 225 index. But the reason that I like uh, the Japanese market is, of course, there are more than 225 stocks in Japan. There are over 3,000. And there are many good, high-quality businesses that we can buy on a name-by-name -name basis and, uh, and beat the Nikkei as a benchmark. So I, uh, I posted this. Let me just check the scissor. I posted this uh, set of highlights earlier when I was comparing uh, the history of the Nikkei from 100 to 40,000 to 20,000, uh, right around the time that the Dow was first hitting 20,000, and comparing what were the different uh, landmarks of the Dow Jones Industrial Average versus the benchmarks of the Nikkei 225. So going all the way back to 1950, back in 1950, if you can think that far back, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was at 220, and the Nikkei was at 100. The first time the Nikkei crossed 1,000 was in 1960. So in 10 years, the index grew by a factor of 10, by grew tenfold. The Dow at that point was only 680. So already back in the 1960, uh, already back before 1960s, in 1950, the Nikkei had already uh, surpassed the Dow. Um, the Nikkei then rose to 2,400 by 1970, and it was only in 1972 that the Dow first crossed 1,000. In 1980, the Nikkei hit 7,000. The Dow was still below its 1973 high of 1,051. Uh, but one thing to notice, in 1971, the yen w uh, finally started floating. From the end of World War II until 1971, when Bretton Woods collapsed, uh, the Japanese yen was set at 360 yen to the dollar. Uh, the reason is there's 360 days in the circle, and the circle was the rising sun and the Japanese flag. Uh, from 1971 until 1980, uh, the yen strengthened from 360 yen to the dollar to 240 yen to the dollar. Then, despite the strengthening yen, the Nikkei crossed the 20,000 mark for the first time in January 1987, over 30 years ago, and then hit a historic high of 38,915.87 in December of 1989. This was at the time that the land under the emperor's palace in Tokyo was valued at more than all of the land in California or more, more, more than all of the land in Canada. This was around the time that the Japanese were buying up uh, major golf courses and major buildings in the United States, and we were all worried that the Japanese were going to take over the world. Uh, during that same decade, the Dow rose from 1,000 to 2,800 over that same decade in the 1980s. And also in the 1980s, the yen, uh, sorry, the yen strengthened, uh, or the dollar weakened, from 240 yen to around 150 yen. So all of this uh, rise in the Nikkei came along with uh, some of the greatest strengthening in the yen at the same time. So after 1989, the Nikkei crashed, and it basically been trading between 15,000 and 25,000 for most of the 1990s. Uh, during that time in the 1990s, the Dow rose from 2,800 and crossed 10,000 and then 11,000 uh, for the first time in late 1999. During that decade, the, uh, the dollar yen exchange rate was, ra was range bound and finally fell to around 120 by the end of the 1990s. In the 2000s, uh, it began really with the dot com bust, the, the collapse in the uh, dot com bubble. Uh, so that was when you see a similar chart 
that you saw in Nikkei 1989 with NASDAQ 2000. And then there was a post 9-11 recession. Uh, Japan lowered its short-term interest rates to zero in 2001. And then the Dow was starting to hit new, new highs of 12,000, 13,000, and 14,000 by 2006. The Nikkei during this time remained tr below 20,000, trading, trading at a range-bound level. And in early 2009, after the Lehman crash and the global financial crisis, it hit a 30-plus low of 7,054.98 uh, in early 2009. During this time, the dollar moderately weakened, and by 2010, uh, we once again saw a dollar-yen exchange rate of 90. In the 2010s, this is the most recent decade we were thinking of, the Dow broke 20,000 for the first time just recently, and the Nikkei just broke 20,000 again for the first time in many, many years, as the yen fell uh, from 90 to 110 to 120. So now, like the correlation chart we saw earlier, now we're in the era where, where you see weakening yen, uh, uh, rising Nikkei. Um, those of you who may be familiar, this is a picture of Nick Leeson, who was one of the most famous, or as you might say, most infamous uh, traders of the uh, SGX Nikkei futures on uh, Symex at the time. Uh, he was trading the, the Nikkei futures in the mid-1990s and blew up Bearings Bank by, uh, by a bet on the Nikkei at the time. Uh, it was tweeted after we submitted these slides, but then uh, he recently put out a tweet saying that the Nikkei had finally crossed the level at uh, which it was trading when, uh, when he blew up Bearings Bank in the mid-1990s. Uh, so it was a bit of a landmark uh, piece, piece of history then, but that's, that's something those who are interested in uh, the history of this futures contract would be interested in. So what about the SGX Nikkei futures contract? Um, it is the most liquid SGX derivative product in terms of notional value traded. Um, so even compared to MSCI Singapore, any Straits Times product, or the, uh, the China A50 product, the Nikkei futures is still the most liquidly traded. In fact, when I was at Bear Stearns, when I was at many uh, other investment banks and we wanted to trade the Nikkei, generally we would trade the SGX futures during Asia hours and the Chicago futures during, during US hours. Uh, so the statistic we have is that it's 10 billion US dollars of daily volume traded in September of 2017, translating into 110,000 lots per day. Uh, it has uh, the most liquid night session, so trading close to 21 hours a day. So uh, that's compared to say about 23 hours a day on uh, some of the other exchanges. It's open for trading on Japan holidays. Um, so even when there's a holiday in Japan, you can trade it because they're traded in Singapore, not in Osaka. And there's also a mini Nikkei contract where I'll be later describing the difference between uh, contract sizes and, how you, and uh, the relative liquidity, how much exposure you would get from each of the uh, contracts. So down below, we have the chart showing the SGX Nikkei futures volume. Uh, the blue lines show the trading during Asia hours, while the green lines show the trading during US, Europe and U.S. hours. Um, and then the monthly volume growth on the right shows the uh, growth in the mini Nikkei futures since the mini futures were launched. Um, there is also another contract called the SGX Nikkei Stock Average Dividend Point Index. So this is a way of trading, uh, basically trading the dividends of, of the Nikkei. So um, it it it, it, rather than doing the classic basis trade where you're going to be trading the cash versus the futures and trying to capture the difference in dividend yield that way, rather what you want to say is how many points are the, um, is the, are the Nikkei components going, how many points of dividends are the Nikkei components going to be paying out in 2018, 2019, 2020? And as you can see, these are relatively long dated contracts so that we're not talking about I'm going to do a short term trade on what dividend is going to be announced tomorrow, but I want to buy a 2018 contract for how many dividends are going to be paid out in 2018 on a calendar year basis. So some sample volumes of some of the different uh, contracts that you can trade. The top block up here shows uh, the different contracts for trading the Nikkei. So the first two are the SGX Nikkei and the SGX Nikkei mini contract. Um, and on this particular day that I took the snapshot on my interactive broker's trading screen, uh, you saw the difference in prices, which is uh, negligible. The volume of the full-size Nikkei contracts was 54,700 contracts that day uh, versus 930 of the mini contracts. Uh, now, what's the difference between the two? The uh, point multiplier is 500 yen per point on the SGX Nikkei futures versus 100 yen per point on the, on the mini futures. Uh, so if you're talking about trading and hedging relatively small sizes, you'd probably be using the, uh, the mini futures, where you'd use, go ahead and use the large futures uh, if you're really trading anything in any decent amount of size. Uh, 
Now, by comparison, the Osaka futures are actually far more liquid now on the minis than they are, on, and I shouldn't say far more liquid, they trade more contracts on the minis than they do on the large one. But the actual yen volume, the actual money volume of the two is actually comparable because you have uh, about 5,400 contracts on the big Osaka contracts and 70, versus 77,000 minis on the same day. And in Osaka, the difference in multiplier is 1,000 yen per point on the big contract versus 100 yen per point on the Osaka minis. Uh, the bottom three are the uh, three. Um, uh, sorry, the bottom three are the three dollar-denominated futures contracts. So the first one is yen-denominated uh, CME Globex, then dollar-denominated CME Globex, and I also had the SGX dollar-denominated Nikkei contract on my screen, but for some reason I didn't get any uh, any volume on that on that day. So. Just just get, getting a quick glance up here, you can see that SGX Nikkei on the very top is one of the most liquid ways of, uh, of trading the SGX index on any given day, just multiplying the 500 yen per point by the number of contracts. The next lot over here uh, are the JGB futures contracts, uh, it's Japanese uh, government bond futures. And these also trade both in Osaka and in Singapore. But one difference that it makes to me as a manager of separately managed accounts, some of which can be relatively small, the SGX futures are 100,000, uh, basically 100,000 yen per point. So the equivalent is a 10 million yen, basically 10 million yen of bond exposure or about 100,000 US dollars per bond uh, versus the Osaka JGB futures contract, which is a million yen per point, 150 million yen uh, per futures contract or the equivalent of over a million US dollars uh, of bonds for, for one contract. And as mentioned uh, earlier, the the standard quoting uh, practice of these bonds is for a standard 6% bond. So a 150 here, you would look at the difference between the December and the March and look at the roll and see what would that give you in terms of excess return for buying and rolling that bond position. The last block over here uh, shows the different uh, foreign exchange futures contracts for trading the yen as a currency. Um, now, if I, if I just want to get immediate Japanese equity exposure, I'll just buy some Nikkei futures. But for, long term, for longer term Japanese investment, I will buy Japanese single stocks, which I believe as a portfolio will outperform the Nikkei. And if I do that by converting into yen, I will use uh, yen futures to hedge back my FX risk uh, so that I'm not exposed to the same problem where the yen goes down, the Nikkei goes up, and I lose money. Uh, so... You'll see here that the, the three main competing contracts for the U.S. dollars and Japanese yen uh, on interactive brokers are the ones on Globex, Globex, the ones on the ICE, and the ones on SGX. And one advantage of the uh, SGX contract is in addition to yen futures on U.S. dollars, they also have the uh, Japanese yen traded against Australian dollars and Korean won. Significant events that, that affect uh, the Nikkei. I prepared these slides before the recent election. Uh, so. Uh, obviously, I had all the pictures here, but any of you who are following the election uh, will see that uh, Shinzo Abe had a, had a big cleanup. He basically did the exact opposite of what, what Theresa May did in the last in the last UK election. Uh, that resulted in a big rally in the Nikkei, going from about the 20,000 level to the 22,000 level. Many people, I think, are quite optimistic on what it means, both for Abenomics and Japan finally getting into a reflation stage um, out of its uh, stagnant growth level. And then on the right side, you have, uh, you have the two central banks going at each other. So in addition to uh, the politics that would, drive, that would drive the Japanese economy, uh, Japan, as you've seen by the yen Nikkei correlation, is very sensitive to monetary policy. And Japan so far has gotten very, very used to a zero or negative interest rate policy on the yen. But one thing that, would, that drives the yen, that drives dollar yen, are relative interest rates between the U.S. and Japan. So think of it this way. If you have Yellen, who still relatively likes low rates, and her soon-to-be replacement, who also likes relatively low rates, but the U.S. is raising rates, that will cause a relatively stronger dollar, a relatively weaker yen, and uh, in turn a rise in the Nikkei. So I'm now going to be talking about three different strategies, uh, all of which have at least one or two different components using some of the SGX futures contracts I was mentioning. The first one is to go long the Nikkei futures. Uh, and long JGBs. So this is a classic um, equity bond allocation where you're owning stocks and bonds and you'll do your asset allocation model where you say, am I going to be 50%, 50%, 30% stocks, 70% bonds, and so forth. Um, and what does that do? 
first of all, you, you, you get to pick up the roll yield from the Japanese government bonds. That's the pure return that I mentioned in my earlier slide, which showed a straight up line from the early 1990s until today, simply from rolling down the Japanese government bond yield curve. The second driver between these two is negative correlation. Uh, generally, when bonds go up, stocks go down and vice versa. So holding both stocks and bonds will give you a more diversified portfolio and a higher risk-adjusted return than just holding, uh, holding one or the other. In addition to doing this as a buy and hold or buy and roll uh, long-term strategy, there are standard long futures trading strategies that you can overlay on top of this, where, for example, you want to do range trading on one versus the other. Uh, one advantage from a foreign investor, if you're a dollar-based investor or a euro-based investor, and you convert only the amount that you need uh, to maintain your margin position, just buying these futures in an interactive broker's account limits your yen exposure. So you get the returns as though it were yen denominated, but then you can convert any of those um, yen gains on your margin account back to your home currency and not be exposed to the entire million dollars or entire notional value in Japanese yen. Now, what are the risks of this strategy? The main risk going forward is stagflation. If Japan sees a, sees a return to high levels of inflation, but without, without real economic growth, that means Japanese interest rates will rise and Japanese stocks will fall. And that would be the one way that both stocks and bonds uh, would lose in this trade. You also have the risk of another credit crisis. Uh, but in this case, most specifically, a credit crisis having to do with the Japanese government or, uh, or the Japanese sovereign. Uh, Japanese government debt, I believe, I'd have to check the rating, is only about single A plus rated. So it's not uh, in the triple A rated club of, of most Western crisis, of most of most Western countries. So that could conceivably be another case that, uh, that drives both bonds and stocks lower. Strategy number two is the one that I mentioned earlier, where I buy a portfolio of Japanese single stocks that I believe have better fundamentals and are, are likely to outperform the broader market. And I hedge uh, by, um, I hedge the currency exposure by selling the yen futures, or basically by going long the equivalent of FX futures, because the FX futures we saw earlier are priced at, are the price of one US dollar in yen. So one of the drivers of this, I am very much taking a view on both of them. I'm saying that a weaker yen will be accompanied by stronger Japanese stocks. And by doing so, I'm gonna make a profit in my Japanese stock position, and it's gonna be uh, hedged by my yen futures position. Uh, the other attractive feature about doing this strategy is I can select less currency sensitive names. Uh, as you notice in the Nikkei, the Nikkei or the Topics Core 30 will contain many international names that sell a lot abroad. So Toyota, for example, Sony will be quite sensitive to a strengthening yen because it means that when they repatriate their profits, their profits in yen are going to end up being lower or it, their yen prices overall would be less competitive abroad. On the other hand, if I focus on more domestically oriented uh, uh, companies, more domestically oriented businesses, they're less sensitive to the yen's exchange rate versus other currencies. Now, what are the risks of this trade? Uh, obviously, if it goes completely against me, uh, if the stocks that I pick go down and, and the yen strengthens, I'll lose on my stock position and I'll lose on my, uh, on my currency hedge. And if my accounts are not combined, if I'm somehow doing these in, in two separate accounts, which is one reason I'm glad I have an, inter an interactive broker's account where I can trade the futures and cash together, uh, I might have a case where I get a margin call on one and uh, get called out of half of my position. Strategy number three is to go long Japanese stocks and sh hedge by shorting Nikkei futures. This is more of a classic uh, long short equity strategy, except instead of taking select short positions on individual stocks I believe are overvalued, I simply hedge my overall beta exposure by, by selling Nikkei futures. Here, what I'm basically betting on is that the stocks I've picked long on my, on my long portfolio will have beta exposure. They will go up and down as the overall Japanese stock market goes up or down. But what I'm expecting is that if the, if the Nikkei goes up 5%, my portfolio will go up 10%. And if the Nikkei falls 10%, my portfolio will only fall 5%. So what that means is that when I put on this position, no matter whether the overall index goes up or down, I'm expecting to catch that 5% difference. Uh, part, of the, uh, part of the driver of this, as you might say, is, are the index inefficiencies. The fact that the index is price weighted and that it only includes 225 large companies gives me the opportunity to find companies that fewer institutional investors are competing over by those smaller mid-cap companies with a uh, higher expected return. The beta hedge, again, hedges me against a, gro a broader sell-off in the broader equity market. What are the risks of this strategy? One is a flight to quality. If you did this trade in 2008, 
Um, much as a small cap. If you could have, if you had enough margin left, you could have held on to that position. You would have done done okay if you could have held through it. But one of the risks of any leveraged or long short position like this is a flight to quality. Uh, related to that, of course, as mentioned, is that there's illiquidity in non-index names. One benefit of being a stock in index component is that with has to trade that name. Uh, and of course, obviously, this is the portfolio I selected uh, underperformed. So those are the three main strategies and my, uh, my big overall description of, uh, of uh, the three different markets, the unique changes of how, of how I use each of them. Uh, hopefully that taught you something that you didn't know about the uh, Japanese market. And now I would like to open the webinar to questions. So I got one question here saying, "Do you do spread trading?" Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure here when you mean by spread. Are you talking about calendar spread between the futures, or what kind of spreads are you talking about? Okay, hold on. I think I've got the question here. Let me see if I can. Can't read this question here. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah. Both calendar spreads and uh, different futures, futures to futures. So, futures, I do not. Okay, there we go. Uh, yes, so sorry. Do I do different futures to different futures? Uh, still hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Um, Oh dear, okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to answer that question anyway. So both calendar spreads and different trades of futures. In Japan, I do not do calendar spreads. Uh, the simple reason is that these are all front month futures with access to the main asset that I'm trying that I'm trying to hedge, whether it is the Nikkei, the Japanese government bonds, or the yen. I will typically do calendar spreads in uh, futures contracts that actually have a backwardation or a contango curve. For example, crude oil, copper, euro dollars, Euribor, and so forth like that. Uh, Japan does not have a very active Taiwar futures market, even though their Taiwar futures do exist. That would be where I would do calendar spreads. And different futures to future, example of a Nikkei versus uh, dollar Nikkei versus yen Nikkei, which is essentially a trade on uh, Nikkei yen correlation. I have done those before. I do not do. Uh, I yes, the is who has been that's somewhat similar to having rates in that it makes the relative prices of Japanese goods relatively cheap to foreigners. So it, it encourages exports. It makes the exporters more profitable. Uh, and in theory, it's also supposed to drive additional inflation within Japan. But despite any yen weakening and despite negative interest rates, Japan has been struggling to get inflation as well as economic growth. Uh, with economic, okay. So next question here with mentioned how does the equity futures pair trade I was mentioning was one where I take one position in stocks and I take the opposite position in futures. For example, taking a long position in different um, in Japanese stocks and then taking a short position in Nikkei futures. So the margin in interactive brokers is something that I'm, I'm not exactly an expert in, but I've always known that if I have a little bit of money there, Interactive Brokers lets me, lets me trade the futures contract. And usually that margin can be um, in the form of stock, in the form of cash, in a different currency, and so forth. Um, okay, so I'm getting asked here, so for stock, one needs T50 or full 100%. Um, so I think that what it means is reg T, 
So uh, if you're asking, if let's say, for example, I have 1 million US dollars in an account, and uh, yes, reg T. So sorry, the question here is mentioning how does margin work for the long stock short, fu or short futures position? Um, so if I have $1 million in, uh, let's say, in an account, and I wanted to convert that into 100 million yen and buy 100 million yen worth of stock, that would be with, with no margin, with no leverage. With Reg T, I could put down 50%, uh, so basically use that to buy 200 million yen worth of stock on the long position. And then the question, and I try to understand if the question means, can I then short futures as a hedge, or would that, or would that go over my my margin limit? Uh, the short answer is I don't know. I'm not a margin limit expert. I do know that in my accounts, I never take take the margin all the way that far to that limit. I will often lever the account up to 1.3 times or 1.5 times. Yes, because you have a hedge, do you get cross margin cross margin benefit? Okay, so I'm having another question about the. Uh, about the margin and the cross hedge and the margin benefit. I do know that Interactive Brokers has, has portfolio margin in account that there are two different assets, especially st long stocks and short futures, which are negatively correlated to each other. And the two possessions, um, and the two pos possessions should increase the, the margin and the margin allowance for that. Okay, I'm getting asked, how would that work for small accounts? So not for portfolio mar margin accounts, for Reg T margin accounts. Um, so going back to small accounts, let me just say, for example, if you have a 50,000 US dollar account, you convert it to 5 million yen in long, in long stock positions, and you were to hedge by selling, let's say, one Nikkei future uh, as, as a hedge. Uh, I actually don't know. I've, I've never tested that. That would be a better question for, for interactive brokers on the margin limits. I believe that would work so long as you haven't already gotten that $50,000 already up to that, uh, that Reg T limit. But again, um, I don't I don't push the limits quite that quite that far, so I, I haven't tested whether whether Reg T margin account would uh, would allow that futures trade. Uh, I hope that's answered. I hope that's answered your question. So, okay. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll I'll uh, I'll t I will take a, take a look into that question and. Uh, and create with the team here and get back to you by email if you don't mind. Okay. Okay. So if you have a question on the margin, please make sure I have your email address, and uh, and uh, I'll look into it and get back to you. Okay, well, it looks like that um, uh, ends those questions. Tarek, I want to thank you very much for your presentation today and would like to remind everyone that we have been recording today's event and you'll all get access uh, to that recording in case you want to come back and review any of the concepts that Tarek dis um, discussed here in today's webinar. So with that, I want to thank SGX for their participation in bringing us today's webinar and um, also Tarek Dennison for today's presentation. So thank you all. You can exit the event using the X in the upper right-hand corner of your uh, control panel and be on the lookout or watch your inbox for both today's recording and a link to the slides that were used in today's presentation. So with that, thanks everyone for your participation here today. Have a great rest of your day um, <clears throat> and thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Cynthia. Thanks, Cynthia. Thanks, bye.